Hello, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Barry Cooper to our series. Uh, Barry is a professor of music at Manchester University. He has also written eight books and numerous articles and uh, research papers on Beethoven. And I must say, when I thought about Beethoven, Barry, I thought about you. So thank you very, very much for being my guest today. I'm delighted to be your guest. Thank you very much for asking me. Barry, it's um, such a huge subject. It's like a space. I, d I don't know really where to start, but we decided that we would sort of concentrate um, on sort of Beethoven's sketches and sort of his creative um, process. I also would like to mention to our listeners that um, Barry has uh, reconstructed or recreated um, the 10th uh, symphony, in fact the one movement of that that was possible to, uh, to, to do. And could we start with this please, because I'm sure it's, 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 it's really wonderful to, to hear from you. How, how, how did it happen? Why, why did you start on this remarkable journey? The, the idea was to write a book on Beethoven's creative process because I didn't think there was one. There seemed to be a little gap in the literature. One, there have been various articles and things which gave some clues about how Beethoven went about composing. I thought a uh, sort of overview of how he composed different types of works at different times would be a, a useful book to write. And this would be my first book on Beethoven. And, and so this took quite a long time. And so I went around various libraries looking at manuscripts uh, of his, looking at sketches. Uh, there were some, in fact, similarly available as well. So I looked at quite a lot. And uh, one batch of sketches was in Berlin, where I went to, to the Staatsbibliothek Preußische Kulturbesitz, as it was in those days. And I wasn't really looking for the Tenth Symphony, but I, I was looking out for it. I mean, I, I knew there were rumors of a Tenth Symphony. And Robert Winter had written an article saying that Beethoven did no more than think about a 10th symphony. So I wasn't expecting to find any, but I did come across some sketches there, which included uh, references to violins and the string instruments and the, the timpani and woodwind and end of the first movement. And I thought, well, these sketches are not known for any known work. And they date from 1825 because you can tell from the surrounding sketches. So therefore, they're obviously for a symphony. And as it's after the ninth symphony, these sketches must surely be for the tenth symphony. Um, so I was convinced they were for the tenth symphony, but it was a very peculiar movement because there was a slow introduction, as I, as I interpreted it, in E flat major, followed by what seemed to be a fast movement in C minor. And I thought it's a very odd structure, but anyway, that's what it seemed to be. And that's a very odd thing to do for a symphony. Then I went home and read up what was, had been said about Beethoven's 10th Symphony. And his friend Karl Holtz had said that Beethoven had played the first movement of the 10th Symphony to him on the piano. And Holtz said, well, it's a very unusual movement because it starts with a slow section in E flat major, followed by a quick stormy section in C minor. I thought, well, that's exactly what I found. So clearly I'd found the 10th symphony that Beethoven had played to Holtz. So obviously not exactly the same version because the Beethoven would improvise a slightly different version each time. So I thought, well, some people might like to hear what this symphony sounds like. But I didn't go very much further. But at the same time, Zika Brandenburg of the Beethoven House in Bonn, he also found some sketches for the 10th symphony dating from 1822 and 1824. And he used the same reasoning to say these sketches must be for the 10th symphony. So by the time I'd put the sketches he'd found alongside those which I'd found, I felt I had got really enough thematic material to uh, create a kind of artist impression of what Beethoven intended. Because uh, I had a, a first theme, a, a second theme, I had a, a, a slow introduction, I had, it was quite clear there was a, meant to be a kind of a reprise of the slow introduction at the end, so he went back to E flat after C minor section. So I had all the, all the complete sort of main ideas, including that one sketch for the end of the movement, and various ideas for the first bit. So I thought, well, I can work out, I have a sort of idea in my head as to what these sound like, and I thought, well, other people in the world who 
don't read Beethoven's sketches that easily might want to know what it sounds like, at least get a vague idea. It's a bit like a, a, a paleontologist finding a few bones from a dinosaur. Well, if you just find a few bones and say, well, this bone is, is six feet long and this bone is nine feet long and this was probably a backbone, it doesn't give you much idea what the animal might have looked like. So what people usually do is create an artist's impression of what this dinosaur might have looked like. Now, the artist obviously won't get it exactly right, uh, but we've all seen pictures of dinosaurs, and of course, these are simply artist's impressions. So I thought well, I can do the same sort of thing with this, this uh, movement of the, of the Beethoven Symphony. So that's how I went about doing it, and, and I didn't know whether I'd succeed or not. It took a long time. I thought, well, I might or might not get a movement. I might get a plausible movement. I don't know. Um, but eventually I had, well, I'd got the whole of the slow introduction done in the first, the exposition of the C minor section. So mm -hmm. I took that along to an academic conference thinking they would think it's a ridiculous idea. But no, they said, no, well, when are you going to do the rest of the movement? So I thought, well, in that case, I, I'll press on and see what happens. So eventually I did have a complete movement uh, uh, ready. Uh, I, and then there was just a sort of kind of piano version, but I had to orchestrate that. So this was why I wanted to ask. So basically, um, you comp as many composers do, so you did all at the piano, and then you later, um, have you commissioned the orchestrations to someone, or? No, no. No, I'm not. I'd, I'd, I'd worked it out more or less in my head. I, I, I could play it on the piano as well, but I, I, was, I was working it out mainly in my head and then trying things out on the piano sometimes, but mostly I knew, I knew what the thing sounds like by looking at it. I mean, just as and not, not every person can do that, but uh, it, it's, it's not a problem for me. Just as most people, if they see a word, they know what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. The same, if I see a piece of music, I know what that sounds like. So I knew what these sketches sounded like, but I experimented one way or another. And um, but was it a hard process to experiment and sort of throw, sort of throw things sort of around? Well, yes. I mean, I, I tried. I tried to just work out what Beethoven would would have done or might have done. This was my aim all the time. Not to what not not to try and be a composer using this music, but try and work out what was Beethoven most likely to have done. Now, obviously, I'm not going to get it right. I'm not going to get it as good as him, but at least to give you some idea. So all the time, I was sort of examining how he might have done it. When it came to the orchestration, again, I, I studied his orchestration very carefully and thought, how would he have orchestrated that bit and this bit? And he did, did put a few clues in, in the sketches. I mean, as I say, one, at one point it's, it's timpani, another point it's, it's tremolando, very low notes, well, that must be cellos and double basses and things like that. So there were a few clues here and there, and the rest of it is orchestrated just as closely as possible in the way Beethoven would have done. So I, I studied uh, the way he orchestrated other symphonies and tried to do something similar. It's, it's remarkable. I, I really, I, I've, I've listened to it and I think it was remarkable. I mean, I wouldn't have guessed, you know, if you told me, uh, you know, this is a piece of music by Beethoven. I mean, of course I would, I would be questioning because I know all the nine symphonies. So I would mm. be questioning, what is this? But it, it's, 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 it's really wonderful. So many congratulations. Um, well, the, well, the main themes are all Beethoven. I didn't have to invent any theme. This is, this is one reason why I, I, I did it because it, there are, there are a few tiny fragments for the later movements and whether Beethoven would have used one or other is not clear. But then we have to start inventing extra themes. So all I did was use the themes which were there and develop them the same way that Beethoven develops his themes in other symphonies. So, so that, that's why it sounds like Beethoven because um, I, obviously I've done my best, but uh, it sounds like Beethoven partly because his sketches were sufficiently clear that, that uh, one, one could uh, build on them. So all, as I say, all, all the themes are his. So you mentioned a lot of bibliotheques and a lot of resources. How difficult is it or was it, and I believe that you're consulting still sketches, uh, to sort of to really gather the information? Um, I believe they're sort of scattered around. Are they all in public places or are, are there some sketches still in private collections? What's the situation? Almost all the sketches that are known are now in public collections. So, and the main ones are in Berlin, Bonn, and Vienna. There are some in Paris and some in London as well, and one or two others scattered around all, all sorts of odd places as well. So one just had to go to these public libraries. So in those days, one didn't have the internet, and so one had to travel and examine the, the original sources. Nowadays, um, the libraries, in order to try to preserve these manuscripts, will only let you see a, a photograph or facsimile of them unless you have some very good reason for why you want to see the originals. 
And so uh, it's, it's more difficult in some ways now, although, although in other ways it's a lot easier because you can look, look at these very clear facsimiles and, and work from those. Mm-hmm. And just out of interest, so, um, you know, let's sort of start discussing the, the, the actual creative process. So was he um, a, a diligent composer, you know, who meticulously worked out? Uh, could you see his process behind of what he's written in sketches or was it just here and there and then elsewhere and sort of a bit of a mess? Well, it was, it was both. It was a bit of a mess and uh, they're here, there and everywhere and the sketches are not systematically laid out uh, for any particular work you often get m- sketches from more than one work on a single page and sometimes you get sketches you don't know what it's from it's obviously a, a, an idea which has got abandoned so the sketchbooks are full of uh, abandoned ideas of all sorts uh, um, and yet you can try and sort of trace more or less a, a typical working method and, and there are certain features which do tend to recur so as I say, because I was already researching Beethoven's, a book on Beethoven's creative process, I'd looked at lots of sketches already. So I wasn't coming to the 10th Symphony sketches as an outsider, as some other people might have done. So I had a pretty good idea of the sort of way that sketches might develop. And uh, there are certain patterns. And this was the thing I found out in the book, that he would begin in a certain way. He'd usually have a few basic ideas of the concept sketch, we call it, the first idea. And then he would develop that in various ways and add a few other ideas and keep refining his ideas. And the latest sketches for a particular piece are often very close to the final version, but they're only usually a melodic line. It doesn't doesn't usually include the harmony as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very interesting. And I guess, I mean, was it typical for the time not to include the harmony in in the sketches and just compose the themes? Well, this is the way Beethoven worked. I mean, most composers didn't write m- many sketches. I mean, Beethoven was n- renowned even in his own day for making far more sketches than anyone else. I mean, Haydn did a few and Mozart did a few, so it wasn't unknown. But Beethoven was much more meticulous and much more extensive in his sketching and spent a lot longer refining his ideas. He had very good ideas to begin with, but they're often a little bit bland to the early sketches, and then he works on them and, and makes them much more sophisticated. And he often gets a very good idea later on. Mm-hmm. But but usually it's a single line sketch. Sometimes it's on two staves, uh, treble and bass. Sometimes he swaps from treble to bass clef, but only on one stave. Sometimes he writes the treble notes and the bass notes on the same stave, and you've got to read the top notes with the treble clef and the lower notes with the bass clef. It's a bit confusing. And there's one work which is a vocal work, which he's using soprano and tenor clefs for the two singers and treble clef some of the time for the orchestra and the bass clef some of the time for the, the bass line of the orchestra. So any one of four clefs might apply for any particular note and it gets very confusing then. Oh, that's, that's really fun. That's almost like a jigsaw puzzle, really. I'm sure that's, that's sort of the feeling you, you might get. But uh, Barry, may I ask you, where did it start? Uh, sort of your love for Beethoven? I mean, y- y- you really are such an expert. Was it uh, you as a young boy or what triggered this interest? When I was a graduate student at Oxford, the professor at the time was Joseph Kerman, who had just transcribed one of Beethoven's main sketch collections, the the Kafka sketchbook. And he set up a a seminar uh, introducing any willing graduate students to Beethoven's sketches and the creative process. And I thought this sounded a very interesting thing to do. I was rather interested in that sort of approach to music. And my, my dissertation was making very good progress. So I thought, well, I've got time to do some of this extra work as well, which not many other students did have. Uh, so we, we, there were probably 10 of us to begin with, but it soon whittled down to only about four. Uh, and luckily, also in Oxford was a man called Alan Tyson, who was a very great expert on Beethoven's sketches and really it showed me exactly what to do with sketches, particularly things like watermarks and, and stitch holes and so on. He was brilliant at that. And the other thing about his, his, uh, his uh, teaching was his, his, his clarity of his explanation was always incredibly good uh, because some scholars uh, sort of couch their language in rather obscure terms, but Alan Tyson was not only could understand things, but he could explain incredibly clearly. So I never had any difficulty following his, his, uh, his lead. I, I never felt I got anywhere near his, his standard, but at the same time, he, he, was, uh, he, he, was, he came to some of these seminars and, and showed us what to do. So transcribing these sketch, sketches with Joseph Kerr and Alan Tyson was really uh, an eye-opener. And I quickly realized that um, to transcribe all Beethoven sketches would take several lifetimes. So I could spend as long as I like with Beethoven sketches and never run out of material. And sure enough, I haven't run out of material after, after all these years.
Yes, yes. So, so Barry, um, how many roughly pages of Beethoven sketches uh, do we know exist? Well, it's very hard to count them because some pages have got great crowds of notes on and others have only got two or three notes altogether. So whether you count that as a page, I mean, it's just got two notes and I'm not sure. Uh, and there are other other pages which are completely blank. So do you count those or do you say, well, that, that doesn't count because it's, even though it's part of a sketchbook, it doesn't have anything on it. Um, others have got, got just got an ink block, but nothing else. So again, you probably wouldn't count that. Um, there's also a problem of what counts as a sketch because if Beethoven alters something in the autograph score, does that count as a sketch? But if he takes out, out that page and replaces it with another one, does that page have been taken out? Does that count as a page? So there are various ways of counting it, but r very roughly speaking, I would say about 10,000 pages of sketches altogether have, have still survive, and there must be many more that got lost while he was still alive. Mm -hmm. And at what stage do the dynamics mark, dynamic marks they kind of appear? Occasionally he puts dynamic marks in his sketches, uh, not very often. Sometimes the very first idea, he'll, uh, when he's just getting a new idea, he wants to fix all the details. He put the clefts and the key signature and the possibly dynamic marks as well, and perhaps a tempo mark. Later on, of course, he doesn't need to do that because he knows what the dynamics are, so he's not going to bother with. So I think he has a dynamic in mind, but doesn't usually put it down in the sketches at the time. And occasionally, of course, he changes his mind. So you find a piano crossed out and enter the bar later or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, 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 sort of, and then the dynamics. So in the first edition, when are they appearing? So, so is it sort of someone asking? Because in the first edition, there are, of course, dynamics. So they are surely by Beethoven. Yes, well, when he writes out the autograph score, he puts in the dynamics. He often adds those later. He often writes the notes first, then goes back and adds the dynamics afterwards. Uh, because we can tell this from some unfinished pages or abandoned pages, there are no dynamic marks on those pages. And then when you look at the final version, you find there are dynamics. So he, he puts the dynamics in, into the autograph score. Sometimes changes his mind, but not very often. Sometimes he adds one or two extra dynamics later on, which were the, intended all the time, but simply not put in. So they're, they're, they're there. And of course, in the later works, he tends to put in far more dynamics in, in the early works. But even in the early works, he tends to put in far more dynamics than, than most of his contemporaries, actually. I, I'm dying to, to know, uh, you know, the question that always bothered me. All these sort of sforzando on a, a completely like a random notes in terms of me as an interpreter. So um, that's definitely not a sleep, right? It's, it's, it was intended for that specific note and only that specific note. That's right, yes, the sforzandos are always on a, on a single note or single chord. The, the exception is, I think, when there's a grace note joining onto a main note, the question is, do you have a swat sander on the grace note or on the main note? Mm. And it's taken me years to work out what seems to have been intended. And I think he means a swat sander to be, to be on both notes um, as a kind of single gesture. It's much easier to envisage that on a violin because you, you sort of accent with a, your bow stroke and just change the finger in the middle of, uh, in the, middle of the bow stroke. But on the piano, you've got to go, of course, you've got to use two different fingers. But that's my impression is that the short sand it really applies to both notes and slightly more to the grace note than to the main note, uh, but, but both accented. And then, then it goes back to whatever previous dynamic it was. Exciting and really interesting. And I really must ask, so what is, and I'm sorry for this question, but I'm sure it's just interesting for the public as well. What is the most difficult thing um, when analyzing Beethoven's sketches? What is the most um, overwhelming sort of bit? Some of the most difficult things are being sure what note is intended in the passage which is unfamiliar. I mean, if, if you uh, look at a, a piece which you know quite well, you see a sketch for that, you recognize the theme and you're not quite sure. The note might look like a D, but it's really meant to be an E. So you say, well, it obviously meant to be an E, but it doesn't actually look like it. If it's, if it's a piece you're not sure of, or one an early stage of the piece, sometimes it's very difficult to decide which note is intended because the position of the notes is not always very exact. So that's one of the main problems. It's often easier if there are ledger lines because you can see exactly how many ledger lines there are at least. But with the main note in the middle of the stave, it's sometimes very hard to see which, which is where the note is meant to be. The other problem is that he often writes words in the middle of, of uh, the, the music. Uh, these might be words of expression or might, might be words of ideas or key changes or something like that, or just a, some kind of comment. 
And deciphering these words is often harder than even deciphering the notes because he writes in a strange Gothic script, which is very hard to read. And uh, even, uh, even if you, if you can read Gothic script, it's often very badly written. And so this, uh, this happens with his letters as well. It's taken some people quite a long time to read his uh, handwriting. The famous example of it, of course, reading his handwriting was this uh, song which he is said to have written called Ich wiege dich in meinem Arm, which means I cradle you in my arm. It's a kind of love song. Now, the song is lost, but the title had survived in Beethoven's handwriting. And this was misread by a scholar as he got about three letters wrong. It came out as Schwinger dich in meinen Dorm, which means swing yourself into my cathedral, which is not quite the same. Now, this parts of the song actually have been discovered and reconstructed recently. So, so this song does exist in the sketches. But it shows an illustration of how his handwriting can easily be misread. Um, that's really fascinating. And I, um, I would like also to ask, so, for example, um, you know, Beethoven has this extraordinary modulation, I mean, change of keys, you know, the, he's, um, he's really pushing the boundaries. So, um, do, do you think he was kind of... Um, experimenting with this ad hoc, or do you think there was kind of a process? Okay, I tried that key, I tried this key. Um, where, because, I mean, you know what I mean, I'm sure. Yes, it, well, it, it varies, I think, quite a bit. I mean, he obviously spent a long time extemporizing and experimenting on the piano, so his sketches were, some of them were kind of written out experiments. And sometimes you get even stranger modulations and experiments in, in uh, just short sketches of about five or six bars, which sort of experiment with some odd texture or, or modulation or technique or something like that. So he, those are the experiments. When he's coming to write a piece, he's just decided he's done his experimenting already. And he decides that a, a particular modulation would work very well in, in a particular place. So he, he uses it. And sometimes he has a sort of key which he's trying to get to. And he, he, uh, he finds a way of getting there. And the famous example is in the Eroica Symphony, which is an E flat major. And there's a, a bit in the middle of the first one, which is E minor. And he takes a long time to get to E minor. You think, well, maybe he composed a, a working forward and he just found himself in E minor sort of thing. But no, the sketches showed he intended to get to E minor from a very early stage. And then his sketches were working out how best to get to that key. So the modulations that the sketches experiment, the sketches are ways of finding out how he gets to the key of E minor and then how to get back again. That's really interesting. But uh, so do, do, can we say that you know, for him, this big modulation, this kind of faraway keys, they're, they're a special place in music. So we need, as performers, we need to kind of really give them special attention and not take for granted, you know, anything that's not a tonic, a subdominant and dominant. Yes, well, performers, I think, might want to do that, to, to, to highlight, to, to just take a little bit more time to em emphasize any element of surprise. So if you, if you find a, a chord you're not expecting, then the performer might do well to hold it back ever so slightly. And I think a lot of performers do that, don't they? I expect you do that as well. But uh, can I ask on that subject of, you know, interpretation? Uh, so um, so the, in the metronome marking, so, so we, we know that, that there are there is only one sonata with the metronome marked. In, I'm talking about Hammerklavier for those who don't yes, know. Yes, the Hammerklavier sonata is the only piano sonata with metronome marks. He's got metronome marks for all his symphonies, in fact, and, and for most of the string quartets as well. Um, my impression is that his metronome marks are usually a pretty good guide, I and mean, occasionally something's gone wrong, and so he, 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 the, the, it's been transmitted as crotchet equals 90 when he means minimum equals 90 or something like that. But usually the metronome mark is, is fairly accurate. With a hammerclavier sonata, it's incredibly fast for the first movement, 138. Um, it is just about playable at that speed. Um, my understanding is that it might actually begin at that speed, but you won't necessarily maintain exactly the same speed all the way through. So I think that's probably what he intended. There's, there's some comments which is often quoted that he says, well, the metronome mark applies to the beginning, but not necessarily all the way through. So uh, the Hammerclavier Sonata could start at 138. Um, I, think, I think one edition thought that minimum 138 is not possible, so it must be at crotchet equals 138, but that's a little bit too slow. So most people play it as more like 108, 112, or something like that, which, which uh, suits, suits me. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's a kind of 
aim for the for the first movie, the 138, and the same with the same with the finale. That's incredibly fast as well. Uh, I think 144 for that. So again, you've got to you've got. Uh, and his pupil Carl Cherney comments on this. He says the main difficulty with this metronome mark is that it's so fast as the first movement, but you've just got to practice. I know that <laughs> they did. That's so so Cherney could play it at that speed, apparently, and I think Liszt could as well. Yes, I'm sure. I mean, I look what they've composed, and I'm sure that 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 was possible. Now I wonder, you know, so. Um, his Beethoven sonatas are extremely difficult, you know, really a technical challenge and musical challenge. So, uh, and they, I understand they were not performed. So he composed them for whom? Just for publishers? I know that, you know, you mentioned, um, um, you, you, you sort of, they're called sort of for making money, I think, um, pot boilers, is that right, the word? <laughs> That, that's the word he apparently used for some of his sonatas. He said, "Just pot boilers." Uh, when he was trying to write the Missa Solemnis, mm -hmm. um, no, they were they were composed for for um, private uh, individuals, to the aristocracy and and um, people who want to learn the piano. And sonatas were being composed quite a lot, and it was a standard form. And they were circulated a great deal. Many copies were sold, so publishers were, were queuing up to buy these sonatas. So uh, they were obviously being used a lot, but not normally in piano recitals. Piano recitals were not, hadn't really been invented then. So you might occasionally get a, a movement of a piano sonata played at a public concert, but not very often, not usually a whole sonata. Occasionally you might get a whole sonata as well. Mainly performed in private situations, in private soirees, um, or just, just within, the, within the household. Yeah, very interesting. And then going back to the sketches. So do we know if Beethoven ever sent someone a sketch or even like a, a work that wasn't completed to get some feedback and perhaps later change something? Or was he just, you know, happy with his own judgments? I don't know if any cases where he sent a sketch to, to someone else saying saying that this uh, so sort of saying please please suggest some changes. I think he worked with that for himself. Like he, he thought he could probably get a, get a better result than, than getting advice from someone else. There have been suggestions that maybe he, he colluded with a violinist or two uh, once or twice. It's not very clear how much he colluded with a violinist um, when he's writing his violin concerto and with with his friend Chopin. So Ignaz Chopin when he's writing his string quartets. So he might have colluded with people a little bit for performance practice in one or two cases, but but I don't know of any case of him sending his sketches to anyone else. The, the, I suppose there was one case where he uh, was asked to write a song, uh, and he he eventually sent three versions of the song, saying, I didn't have time to produce a good one, so here are, here are some attempts. So that's near as we get to a sketch being sent to someone, is his three attempts at the song, and then he, then he produced the fourth attempt later, later on, which is slightly more polished. Yeah. Very interesting. And do we know, so because of course the symphonies were performed, so do we know of any changes that have been made uh, on request uh, from performers? You know, we sort of know that um, later composers, they started to sort of adjust the piece after a rehearsal. Do we know of that practice? Well, Beethoven occasionally adjusted the piece after he heard it. The, the famous case is the Fifth Symphony, where he made some changes and sent it to publisher, which he said he made during the performance. Now, I'm not quite sure how you make a change adding a bar during a performance, but uh, the fourth bar of the Fifth Symphony was added late, and so the publishers had already printed the first page of the symphony, and so he had to, they had to reprint the first page with the extra bar in. And so he does it that way. He doesn't uh, usually get performers to... Uh, make suggestions to changes and usually when performers said they can't play that they, he just said well you've got to try and uh, there's a famous comment that Schuppan says Beethoven made he says what do I care about your wretched fiddle when I'm in, inspired by my music so you just expect the performers to get get by and, and, and practice if necessary and he writes extremely difficult music nowadays we have very many good performers so it doesn't seem quite so difficult as it did at the time but a lot of it seemed impossible to play it or sing at the time uh, his vocal music was the same um, of course the singers in those days were just as good as the singers today and so nowadays singers often complain how difficult it is whereas performers don't uh, instrumentalists tend, tend not to do that nearly so much because there are so many good ones about but singers in, the, in Beethoven's day were, were equally good but he still wrote things which were almost impossible to sing 
and they still are. And someone said to Beethoven that, that they'd heard his Fidelio at the theatre the previous night. He said, no, you didn't hear my Fidelio at the theatre last night because they can't sing it. Oh, Barry, I mean, I, 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 can we say he was a rather difficult man in that sense, sort of, you know, music concerning matters? In terms of music, he, he was determined not to make changes on, uh, well, uh, unless he thought they were the right changes. So when people say, can't you change that, can't you change that, he would say, no, I'm not going to change it. It wouldn't be so good then. The, there were one or two folk song settings he made. He sent them to George Thompson in Edinburgh. And George Thompson said, well, this is a bit too difficult for, for our Scottish lassies. Can you make some changes? And Beethoven said, no, I never change my pieces, but I'll, I'll do another setting instead. So he did that. But he wouldn't make a change. He said, "Once you change one thing, you've got to change everything else as well, because it, it sort of refer, it affects the whole the whole shape." So he was reluctant to do that. Uh, of course, Fidelio, his his opera, he he revised several times, but that was each time to try and make it better and more suitable to the theatre than than it was originally. Barry, that's a really uh, absolutely fascinating glimpse uh, into Beethoven's life. Um, I think we can we can talk for absolute ages, but um, I I just like to thank you for giving us uh, yeah for opening the door what uh, usually people just don't know and um, especially for presenting this in a very a kind of open minded and also. Um, just the way that everyone can understand. That, that's my special thanks to you because um, I know not everyone is, is, <laughs> is really into some kind of special language and things. So really, thank you very, very much for this um, conversation. Well, thank you very much too. And, and as I say, I've tried to be as clear as Alan Tyson always was. And I don't know if I succeed or not, but that, that's always my aim to make sure my, my explanations are as clear as his. If I've done that, I'm, I'm very glad. Thank you very much for asking me. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Bye-bye.